We're going to talk today about fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is a very difficult problem. Uh, a lot of people don't think it exists. Their people think the patient is, uh, has a psychological problem, depression. Um, there are a lot of rheumatologists now that are diagnosing but not treating, and which really doesn't help the primary care person to send somebody down and be told that, you know, you have fibromyalgia, but I can't help you. Um, there are other, pay, play, uh, I know some of my colleagues at UAB now, they don't even diagnose it. They just give people a lot of injections for it uh, and, and tell them they have multiple uh, bursitis. So we're going to talk today about the science of fibromyalgia, and I hopefully you'll, you'll see that there are insights into how to help these people. We can get a lot of them. I mean, I have people now that are coming in saying, I just need my refills. I'm good. And I've never heard that before with fibromyalgia. Um, the, the criteria has involved uh, tender points. There are 18 tender points that were identified. This was a long time ago, 1990. So uh, there is a revised criteria, but it still hasn't been accepted by the American College of Rheumatology. Uh, it's widespread pain in all four quadrants for over three months. Now, Dan Claw, who's at the University of Michigan, and I'm going to show you some of his research. Uh, he's he talks about fibromyalgia ness. He doesn't really count any tender points. So that's kind of a direction it's going, but um, these people can have a lot more than the 18 tender points. I mean, some of these people are tender uh, everywhere. One of the problems with people with fibromyalgia that they have with their family and their doctors and going to the emergency room and uh, their friends is they don't look bad. They look fine. You know, this is actually an ad from hepatitis C. And it says, if you, if you may, if uh, fibromyalgia made you look this bad, would anybody doubt you were sick? And that's one of the issues with these people. They look fine. I mean, you see them in the office and they look normal. So the problem is really in the uh, neurologic, is a neurological problem, and we're going to talk about that. Now, this is a clinical diagnosis. There's no lab test for it. There's no x-ray, MRI, CT scan. Um, substance P is elevated. There are at least four studies now showing substance P is elevated in the spinal fluid, uh, but that is not a, a, a test we do in the office. I mean, that is a, a research uh, test. A lot of other symptoms that can go with this, these people have a lot of stiffness. A lot of times they do have pain uh, around the joints, and so they can, maybe you'll think, maybe they have rheumatoid or lupus or something like that. Um, one of the doctors I know that he, he talks about pain over the joints and between the joints. So I think if you find people like you're palpating the wrist, but they're also tender in the forearm and they're tender, you know, everywhere you're touching, they're tender, that's probably going to be uh, fibromyalgia, at least part of their condition. Uh, they can have headaches, they can have burning in the extremities. A lot of these people end up with a lot of tests because they have a lot of different symptoms. There is a lot of cognitive and memory problems. Uh, we call it fibro fog, or that's been the common kind of thing. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what might be causing that, but um, I think that's one of the difficult things. The person comes in, they don't feel well, they're hurting all over. You got to do something for me, doctor. But they can't even hardly give you a history because they got this cognitive kind of problem. And if you're lucky, it'll be Friday afternoon late and there'll be a new patient. And it's a tough, you know, it's a tough situation. Um, there have been some links to um, uh, genetic links to maybe fibro, uh, to, in fibromyalgia to maybe serotonergic and norepinephrine metabolism, so some of that is probably going on. There are a lot of associated conditions, and so you have people have IBS, and they have TMJ, and they have uh, anxiety, and they have Raynaud's, and they have mitral valve prolapse and dysautonomia. Now, some of these things actually make sense in the sense that we um, see uh, hypermobility in a number of these patients. And I run this Congress of Clinical Rheumatology, which is in Destin every year in around May. And uh, we're getting up to about this, I think we're the second largest rheumatology meeting in the country. We started in the basement at Brookwood and it just keeps growing and growing. And we have Rodney Graham, who's done all the research on this from London coming this year. But this is very interesting. A lot of these patients, they're very limber. They're, um, 
sometimes they don't remember it uh, as such and you have to kind of bring it back because as you get older you lose that ability to be limber but you can ask them if they can touch their thumb to their forearm and they can say, oh yeah, I can do that. And you, their elbow maybe hyperextends or when they're, you know, they used to be able to put their leg behind their head. Um, they can, they sublux uh, shoulders and hips. Sometimes they'll pop them out, pop them in. Uh, they have weak ankles. They can have scoliosis. Uh, they get this vascular instability, they have migraine, they may have Raynaud's where their fingers are turning blue, they have dysautonomia, they have panic attacks. Uh, they get the, uh, this is of course dysautonomia, they get resistance to xylocaine, so you numb them up. Or you ask them, have you gone somewhere? Yeah, I went to the ER, they had to give me like four shots before I could get numb. They have fibromyalgia, they have a lot of disc problems because the collagen is softer, so the discs wear out faster in the neck and the back. Uh, they can get varicose veins, hernia, uterine rectal prolapse, again, because of the soft collagen. They have this genetic predisposition, so a lot of times you ask them, you have my son, he can take his leg, put it on his head, or you know, I, I, you know they re remember other people in the family that are hypermobile. They get this thin, I mean, this velvety skin, so you can actually just palpate in their skin. You know, a lot of times I look at their problem list and I see they got disc problems, they got TMJ, they got panic attacks, they got, you know, and I'm, all of a sudden I'm saying, I, this person's probably got hypermobility. Uh, they have osteoarthritis on the hands, they get chondromalacia of the patella, TMJ dysfunction, T, um, and they get anxiety. A lot of these people have a lot of anxiety. Usually it's Marfan's, uh, Marfan's less than Ehlers-Danlos type 3. So the most common thing is Ehlers-Danlos type 3. Marfan's, uh, you can kind of pick those people out by the way, you know, their arm span is greater than their height. Uh, but a lot of times, I mean, one thing I've noticed that's not in the criteria, that a lot of these are better looking women too. So I tell the husbands, boyfriends, and fiancés that it's like a Ferrari versus four-wheel drive. I mean, these people... But they, you know, the nice thing to put all this together for them is they have all these problems. You know, they come in, they go to a neurologist for their headaches, and they got the oral surgeon for the TMJ and all this stuff. And you can say, you know, this all belongs in this hypermobility. So I think this is something that is, is fairly common. And if you start looking for it, you, it's like, you know, in the old days when they found mitral valve prolapse, it was kind of a rare thing now. You know, they say it's like flat feet and bushy eyebrows. You know, almost a lot of people have it. And same thing with hypermobility. A lot of people have it, but it helps them to kind of understand it. Now, fibromyalgia is a condition of widespread allodynia. And allodynia is where you have pain at a uh, stimuli that are not normally painful. You know, you come up to your relatives or whatever, or somebody, and you give them a hug. It's not supposed to hurt them. These people have pain even with uh, like a hug. So here's your normal pain response, and this is the stimulus intensity on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is the pain intensity. And so you give somebody a hug, it's not supposed to hurt them, but if it was a football player and they're giving you a bear hug and breaking your ribs, you know, you'd have severe pain. And this, it's amazing, this pain curve looks a lot like the hemoglobin desaturation curve. What happens is you, and these patients, there may be an injury or uh, there may be some kind of an autoimmune problem that we're gonna talk about cytokines uh, can affect the pain system. It shifts the curve. So all of a sudden these people get a hug and it's painful or their husband grabs their arm. It does, you know, it's not a painful kind of grab and it's painful. And so pretty soon these people are hurting with um, almost any kind of uh, input. You know, they like their grandkids but they don't like them jumping on them because it hurts and you know, pretty soon it's interfering with all their social relationships and it's, a, it's an issue. So this, when it's painful, where it's not supposed to be painful, that's called allodynia. Where it's more painful than it should be, that's called hyperalgesia. So the person comes in, they get their blood drawn, everybody knows that hurts when you get your blood drawn, but these people have an ex exaggerated response. This is a study done by Dan Claw at the University of Michigan, and it's kind of a key thing to understand. Here is the stimulus intensity and they did this stimulus intensity. There's a dolorimeter where you can actually put pressure and measure how much, how many, how many kilograms per square centimeter you're applying. And they did this to normal people, and this is at this level, and that's how much pain they had. So then they, they did it to fibromyalgia patients, and they had experienced this kind of pain with the same amount of stimulus. 
Then they said, well, how much would we have to apply to a normal person to get that same kind of pain? And you had to go all the way out here on a normal person to get that same. The interesting thing, they've done functional MRIs and they're showing that the brain activates in these fibromyalgia patients here the same level it does in normals at this level. So to the person's brain, this is a real, real pain. Now there are possible causal systems in fibromyalgia and we're going to focus on a couple of them. We're going to focus on the NMDA receptors. And how many people here know about an NMDA receptor? Anybody? Okay, so that's very important in this chronic pain. Substance P, wind up, central sensitization. This is all part of probably what happens in fibromyalgia. You have endorphin, serotonin. There are other issues with the sympathetic nervous system. You know, they talk about abuse. You know, a lot of these uh, people, or at least some, have had history of uh, child abuse. Uh, trauma issues, nor, uh, there's the um, neuroendocrine system, dopamine, and then we're also going to talk about cytokines because we see a lot of fibromyalgia in people with lupus, Sjogren's, Hashimoto's, a lot of these autoimmune conditions. Probably explains like chronic Lyme, you know, chronic Lyme, they don't think these people really have Lyme anymore, that, that, that there's no organism anymore, but they have a lot of pain and it's probably fibromyalgia. So here is the normal situation. Acute pain and chronic pain are really not the same thing. They're different. And acute pain, when we, when we like stub our toe or whatever, we activate the AMPA receptors and then uh, the, the, we have pain from that. When you have chronic pain, you get these NMDA receptors activated. Substance P is released. Uh, you have glutamate that gets released. And it turns on a whole system. It's a lot more... Um, um, significant and it occurs for a lot longer, you even get gene expression. So chronic pain is a lot different than, than acute pain. Now they're saying maybe if you treat acute pain, you can prevent chronic pain. We have the descending pathway that helps to stop pain. So you have endorphins and keflins, of course opioids. Uh, these are our natural opo opioids in our body. Uh, the GABA, is a down regulator. Now GABA is stimulated like alcohol. Uh, it's probably why people drink a lot. You know, I mean, they, you know, bump their head. They don't even feel it, you know. Uh, or, uh, you know, your benzodiazepines work at GABA. 5-HT uh, is serotonin, norepinephrine. So a lot of our newer drugs for fibromyalgia, Cymbalta and uh, Civella, they both work here with norepinephrine, 5-HT. So this down regulates pain. Upregulation, when you stimulate the NMDA receptors, they're, they're glutamate receptors. So it's probably why people go to the Chinese restaurant, they get a lot of MSG, they have headaches, uh, a lot of symptoms associated with, uh, with uh, glutamate. I tell people with fibro, stay away from uh, MSG. Uh, aspartame, which is aspartic acid, uh, NutraSweet, it stimulates NMDA receptors. So that some people take, uh, they drink aspartame, they get headaches. Um, substance P is um, upregulation of pain and nitric oxide. So we have these, these things that balance each other off. Now most of us don't have any problem with this and we're all balanced out, but people that get into chronic pain, they, they uh, have a, a, their balance is off as far as this. One thing about the nervous system is plastic, it's not hardwired, so we do change with the input. And it's why we see like post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, because these people, their nervous system has changed from this input. Same thing with fibromyalgia and uh, chronic pain. So upregulation of pain, acute pain becomes chronic pain. So this can be why the person's in an auto accident, you know, they get hurt. And now, you know, months later they got fibromyalgia. Uh, and then we, of course, want to try to downregulate pain, and we're going to talk about that. So you have pain generators, and this would be like chronic osteoarthritis. They think fibromyalgia in studies is more common as people get older. So we all of us get osteoarthritis. They say we'll all get it if we live long enough. So I guess everybody hopes they get it. Uh, the, um, these pain, pain generators then stimulate these NMDA receptors, and you get this wind up. And we're going to talk about all this in a second here. So NMDA receptors, these are glutamate receptors. Um, if you um, stimulate them in animals, you know, then, and they have no lawsuit involved, and you know, they're 
not married, and you know all these things that we think are involved in chronic pain. But if you uh, stimulate these NMDA receptors in animals, they get chronic pain. And if you block them, you can abolish the windup. And they did a study in Sweden where they gave patients with fibromyalgia intravenous medications. They gave them IV morphine, IV xylocaine. When they gave them IV ketamine, they didn't have, uh, eight out of 13 didn't have any pain for three weeks. So ketamine is an anesthetic, you know, it causes hallucinations, so nobody uses it in anesthesia. I remember I did a preceptorship in anesthesia back a long time ago, and they were using, still using ketamine, and people really had some bad trips with that. But ketamine is available like topically, so we do use, people, we do use ketamine, it is a controlled substance. Um, the NMDA receptors, this is not a lot to look at, but there's, they are blocked by magnesium, so here's the magnesium that blocks it. Uh, so that's why I think people use magnesium for headaches, chronic headaches. Uh, we tell people with fibromyalgia to take uh, calcium, magnesium, zinc. You know, magnesium and zinc. Zinc is actually antagonizes NMDA receptors. Try to stay away from things that stimulate them. Substance P is a neuropeptide. Uh, it has been found in four studies to be elevated in the spinal fluid in fibromyalgia. And it can lead to this hyperexcitability of the central uh, neurons. I'm not sure what the function of substance P is in our bodies, but I'm, I'm thinking, you know, if you go out in the field and you get stung by something, you're kind of like on guard and you can feel everywhere in your body, like trying to figure out where it came from. And that's probably helpful at that situation, but in a patient that has uh, fibromyalgia or has that kind of hyperexcitability all the time, it's not a good thing. So we have this wind-up phenomenon, and what, basically what this is in the blue is the NMDA that's unblocked, and in the orange is the NMDA that's blocked. And what happens is if you block NMDA, you stimulate 10 times, you get 10 responses. So you turn the light switch on 10 times, the light comes on 10 times. When you don't have it, on, when it's unblocked, which is a natural situation, you stimulate the nerve 10 times, it responds 60 times. So that's this whole thing about wind-up. In other words, these people have chronic pain or they have an acute pain and it keeps stimulating their pain system and it's giving them this wind-up and then they get hyper-excitability and, a, and it's, a, it's not a, a good situation. And they end up in your office on Friday afternoon. Uh, central sensitization, this is a long-lasting reflex. This is in the... Uh, contralateral limb, so it indicates that it's a central process, it's not a peripheral kind of thing. It's in the brain, that's why I think fibromyalgia, you know, this is a, a central nervous system problem. Uh, it leads to this non-nociceptive or harmless uh, impulses being felt as painful, and it may be the basic mechanism in fibromyalgia. So this slide just shows what we were talking about, the glutamate, substance P, but the down regulation of this is GABA. And uh, GABA is a uh, GABA, or gamma aminobutyric acid. It's a uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter. It balances to the excitatory NMDA receptors. And it is stimulated by benzodiazepines, uh, the uh, phenobarbital, alcohol. So a lot of the things that people, it tends to downregulate the nervous system. All the hypnotics like Ambien, Sonata, Dalmain, the rest of all of them work at GABA. Uh, so most agents that we have right now for GABA, they lead to tolerance and, um, which, and the problems with withdrawal when you stop them. So we have this balance between GABA and NMDA. GABA is inhibitory. If you get too much, you know, you go to sleep, or if you get way too much, you go into a coma. That's why people black out, you know, drinking alcohol. Uh, decreases pain. NMA, NMDA is excitatory, stimulation, increases pain too much over you get a seizure. So in a, like most things in our body, there's a balance. And you've heard of, uh, you know, uh, calcitonin and parathyroid, and you've heard all these different balances, uh, glucagon and insulin, and this is another one in our body, NMDA and GABA, and, you, and it's important to kind of understand this. Now there are other uh, abnormalities in fibromyalgia uh, some studies have shown uh, endorphins are low, that they increase with exercise, muscle strength and physical fitness is bad in these people. Um, 
decreased serotonin. There's a lot of things that have been reported, but I'm not going to talk about much of that because I don't think it's that helpful. One thing that is helpful is to know a little bit about cytokines now. Patients don't know much about cytokines. I remember a few years ago we talked about it at our rheumatology meeting and people were thought, you know, why are we getting into all this basic science? Well, now all of a sudden we got Embrel, we got Simsia, we got Humira, we got uh, Symphony, we have Remicade, all targeting TNF, which is a, a cytokine. I mean, we're using interferon in uh, hepatitis C, which is a cytokine. Um, there are all these new drugs for psoriasis that are, there's a new um, um, IL-12 drug and all this. These cytokines are produced by um, T cells and we see a lot of it in our patients with RA, lupus, Sjogren's, Hashimoto's, but I think we see them in a lot of people, maybe chronic mono that people talk about and chronic Lyme and all these things that are so difficult. It's probably a lot of it cytokine related. Uh, Wallace, Dan Wallace at UCLA, he, he recognized that people getting injections for cancer were having this syndrome with severe fatigue, myalgias, flu-like symptoms that looked like fibromyalgia. And then he did a study and he found that levels in fibromyalgia early on were elevated of cytokines. And then they also found a pathway where cytokines stimulate substance P release. So it makes sense that maybe a lot of your patients that have maybe some kind of a low-grade autoimmune thing, it's stimulating substance P. A lot of those people, we treat them with Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine, that'll lower substance P and their pain gets better, their fatigue gets better. Cytokines are these protein molecules. They are secreted by glial cells in the nervous system and other cells. And they are signaling, they're like a language between our uh, autoimmune cell, I mean our cells, like T cells and B cells. And this is a very interesting study. It was done in Israel. What they did, they took men, and it's interesting they took men because women tend to get a lot more of a Hashimoto's, Sjogren's, lupus. But they took men and they gave men uh, IV endotoxin and I don't know, I don't know if that get, it would get approved in the United States, but they did. And they, they did psychological tests on these men and they did cytokine levels. They were all normal. They gave the men the endotoxin IV, which is a bacterial product, stimulates the immune system. Cytokine levels went up. Uh, they did psychological tests and these men were having trouble with depression, anxiety, decreased verbal and nonverbal memory. Um, it's like our patients we see with these conditions. So I think this fibro fog, in my mind, is probably a cytokine related kind of thing. And when you get rid of it, these people come in and they can talk normal and they can tell you what they want pretty quick and they can ask for a refill and you can send them home and they're not there for an hour going over things from, you know, that's, that they're so confused about. If you look at the CNA and act CNS actions of these cytokines, IL-1, which is, we do see in Sjogren's, sleep disturbances, psychomotor retardation, anxiety, uh, anorexia, sickness behavior. I mean, this is seen in animals. Um, IL-6, you, get it, you see IL-6 is actually lowered by Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine. Fever, depression, and it can be involved in some of these hormone uh, secretions. TNF-alpha, which we do target, uh, Phil Mickelson's taken, you know, Enbrel, which uh, that's how I get into cytokines sometimes with patients. I said, you heard of Phil Mickelson, the golfer, oh yeah, he's taking that medicine. Yeah, that's Enbrel, it's anti-cytokine. This isn't like outer space. This is stuff we're using like every day. And uh, inflammation, edema, fever, cognitive function is of involved memory. And then you look at interferon gamma, you look at thought stoppage, speech stoppage, psychomotor slowing. So a lot of, I think, a lot of this kind of behavior we see, cognitive dysfunction, is related to cytokines. Psychiatric disease, I mean, I think a lot of doctors I think these people have a lot of psychiatric illnesses, but the studies really show that they're not severe psychiatric illnesses, that most of, most of them don't. Now, there are a subset, of course, that do, but uh, most don't. And I think a lot of this cognitive dysfunction, fibro fog, is cytokine related. So let's get to treatment. Now treatment is we want to control pain, we want to improve their sleep, and we want to um, help their fatigue. And if you look at um, all these things that we have out there, drugs, supplements, physical measures, journal articles, anecdotal reports, we got a lot of uh, our own personal clinical experience, 
we got all this promotion. That's one of these things that a lot of people are trying to make money off anybody that has some kind of chronic problem. We have to basically, in practice, put all this in and get it, and all we get out is a little drop, you know. We have three medicines now that have been approved for fibromyalgia, uh, Civella, Cymbalta, and, um, and uh, Lyrica. But this was like pre-approval um, of those drugs. And they asked patients, what were you taking for fibromyalgia? And a lot of them, a lot of doctors tell you never use any narcotics in fibromyalgia. But you look at what's the number one drug, Vicodin. Somebody told me yesterday that 99% of all the hydrocodone is used in the United States and the worldwide. I don't know if that's true, but, uh, but I know that is an issue. But you can see the, a lot of these people were taking uh, narcotics, a lot of them Ultram, which has been shown to be helpful, or Tramadol, Flexeril, Neurotin. You can read the list, but there's a lot of things that you see a lot of our patients taking. And um, here's another study that was done of almost uh, 2,500 patients, published about six years ago. Again. You look at what's most commonly treated, what's the most helpful, hydrocodone, uh, as, as a, a prazolam, oxycodone, zolpidem, and then, um, so again, not really, people recommend one thing, but you, we see what our patients are taking. And I think that's a hard thing in practice. You know, patients come in and say, doctor, I need something for pain, and what am I gonna get for pain? And then it's, it's hard not to know what to do, or what to do. So polypharmacy is the norm. I tell this, you, a lot of these patients are taking multiple drugs. 25% uh, were taking over five medications for fibromyalgia. Uh, so we're not gonna cover right now all the narcotics, non-narcotics, non-steroidals. Non-steroidals have never really been shown to be helpful in fibromyalgia. I think they do, of course, help osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, but not fibromyalgia. We are gonna talk about these other um, agents, at least some of them. So if you look at a lot of the other drugs that have been used or are used, none of these others are approved for uh, fibromyalgia. Um, tricyclics have been the first ones probably used, uh, but they're not approved. Uh, opioids not approved for fibro. So the only thing approved is Lyrica, Cymbalta, and Sabella. And these are the tricyclics, and uh, everybody's used Elevil probably, and it's a good drug. <laughs> Cheap, doxepin, another good one, uh, cyclobenzaprine. You know, cyclobenzaprine, people say, why is a muscle relaxer up there? But it, you know, it's really a tricyclic. It's in that it's really, the closest relative is, is um, of flexoril is, uh, am, you know, is in the tricyclic uh, group. So these were the studies that were done with um, amitriptyline. And you can see in the short term, people got better, but in the long term, there was really no difference with placebo. And I think that's one of the things we see with these patients. It's very frustrating. You give them something like Elevil, they come back, you know, in a couple uh, weeks to a couple months and they're good. And then long term, it's, it quit working. Now the SSRIs, we've never really shown, at least in the initial studies, did not show those worked. But lately they found out that it was probably because the dose was too low and you know, people are dosing a lot of the psychiatrists. You see people back and they're using way above the dosage that's been recommended. I mean, the problem we all get into with that is that uh, you get into all this pre-cert of everything and that you're having to pre-cert even like generics and it's crazy. Now the SNRIs are the ones, the two of the ones that are approved. Uh, venlafaxine or Effexor is not approved. Uh, Cymbalta and Civella are approved. Now one thing that is interesting is that these are not all the same. I mean they're all SNRIs. They do serotonin and norepinephrine re reuptake inhibition. But you can see that the ratio of norepinephrine to serotonin is very different. 1 to 30 for Effexor, uh, 3 to 1 for Civella, and 1 to 8 for Cymbalta. So these are really not interchangeable. I know a lot of our patients that come in, you know, Cymbalta did just go generic, and I've had patients tell me that the price has really come down, which is great, because uh, I understand Lilly had two drugs, and they had uh, one they thought was going to be a blockbuster, and they put Cymbalta on the shelf and didn't do anything with it, and then the other one didn't work out, and they got Cymbalta, but that's why it had such a short life. You know, we just seemed like we just got it not too long ago, and it's already generic. Uh, but these inhibit both norepinephrine and serotonin, as we said earlier, both of those downregulate pain. 
This is a study on uh, Cymbalta, 60 milligrams once or twice daily, and uh, daily significantly reduced pain in more than half the women treated for fibromyalgia. And um, they were supposed to, they were more likely to have a sustained improvement, 44% versus uh, 19%. And then here are the study, the, just the pictures, the graphs, you know, showing the effect of Cymbalta. And um, all of them, they're, they're, a lot of these studies, they're looking for 30% reduction in pain, which is really, um, you don't think it's very much. It's enough that the patients will notice it. This is the fibromyalgia impact questionnaire. This, the lower down here, the better these people are functioning. So uh, again, the, uh, as far as side effects with um, Cymbalta, nausea, dry mouth, you know, nausea is the norepinephrine part of these drugs. That's why it's Effexor, we always had a lot of trouble with nausea with Effexor. Uh, dry mouth, constipation, somnolence, decreased appetite, increased sweating, agitation. Um, Savella, this was uh, uh, again a study on the, the pivotal trials used to get Savella approved. It's again a, a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. And um, this is the last, ob the baseline observation carried forward. This is the same study, but they just uh, did the observation uh, carried forward. And, uh, you can see it, it looks better always in here. The FDA always requires this kind of thing, but all of it was significant, so it did work. Savella, I think, is a good drug. I, I did two of these trials. Um, the problem we've had with Savella, of course, is high blood pressure because you are stimulating norepinephrine, and then I've had people with tachycardia. Um, some people have really bad nausea, again, with the norepinephrine, so it's a good drug, but um, you have to, you know, uh, monitor the patients. Again, the uh, side effect profile, nausea, constipation, hot flush, hyperhidrosis, uh, heart rate increased, hypertension, so th those kind of things we have seen in practice. Let's look at the antileptic, antileptics and uh, we have Neurontin or Gabapentin and then the, the Lyrica which is pregabalin. Um, pregabalin actually came from Neurontin it's different, but it came from there. Uh, of course, gabapentin is generic, so a lot of the patients really would rather take that than Lyrica because of the cost. We, there's Topamax on here, but um, Topamax is really, I think, good for migraine prevention, but I'm not sure that it's really good in fibromyalgia. So gabapentin has been shown in animal models to help allodynia and this um, uh, hyperalge hyperalgesia it's been approved for diabetic peripheral neuropathy, for uh, post herpetic neuralgia, genital urinary. It's been used for refractory genital urinary pain. Uh, it's uh, been used in diabetic neuropathy and found to be uh, uh, better than um, amitriptyline with less side effects. The side effects are dizziness, somnolence, headache. You know, these anti-seizure drugs, basically what they're trying to do is slow nerve conduction. So I think a lot of people do feel that. You know, they, they take it and they say, I don't, you know, I'm not thinking it like I should. So that can be an issue with these drugs, and I'm sure you've all seen that. Uh, Pregabalin is, came from gabapentin. It's been approved, and it works really the same way as gabapentin. The, the, uh, it, it, again, decreases uh, neural transmission and some patients will notice this as a side effect. One of the big differences in these two drugs is, is, is seen here. Here is the dose, and on this axis is the dose of both of them, but look at pre, gabapentin is in the pink, and pregabalin or Lyrica is in the green, and you can see Lyrica is a lot more linear, and you get a lot with gabapentin, the bioavailability goes down with these higher doses. So you give a lot more of the drug, and you're just not getting that same kind of impact that you get with Lyrica. So Lyrica, I think there is this dose response that's a lot better, seems to be more effective. But again, it depends on the patient if they can afford it. Um, this was an uh, eight-week study. Here's the, the, they use 150 milligrams a day, 300 and, five, and 450. In the fibromyalgia studies, they, were, they really showed effect when they got to 300 and 450. There are a lot of patients who can't really take that much. Uh, it's hard to get them up to that level. 
And they showed at the 450 that there was a significant decrease in pain. 48% uh, had at least a 30% reduction in pain. So this is not, it's good. You know, it's not, I don't think it's a um, home run hitter or, you know, your top uh, quarterback, Heisman Trophy winner, but uh, it did work. Um, and they found statistically significant improvement in pain as early as a week. The, di the problems with it, again, the dizziness, somnolence, like we see with gabapentin, but these people have a lot of get edema, and I guess you've all seen that, edema with Lyrica. And you also get weight gain. And when Lyrica was a new drug, I was, they told me I was like the number one prescriber in the whole state. We had all these people waiting for it. We knew it was going to be good. And they came in and said, Doctor, my pain is so much better, but I've gained 30 pounds. And I think that is a big issue with Lyrica is a lot of weight gain. And what it does is it blocks its satiety center. Our body has a satiety center, which is a serotonin-based thing. Somebody told me that it's like there's a sea sponge and it swims through the water and opens its mouth. And when the gut fills, there's a nerve that fires off and it tells the, brain, the mouth to close, you know, and I guess before the back end blows out. And we have that same thing in our body. It's called satiety center. And when you eat, you're full, you quit eating. What happens with a lot of these antidepressants and with Lyrica, you block the satiety center and you don't feel full and the patients call it grazing you know you go back through the kitchen and it's sort of like the cows out in the field you know they're grazing and they're eating all day and and uh, so people gain a lot of weight there is actually a new diet pill that is actually works to um, stimulate the satiety center so there's a new one that just came out so this satiety center is a real thing and it's uh, we even have a drug now to, to, um, um, to block it uh, go to the antispasticity. We did a study, I did actually my own study with Tizanidine or Xanaflex. These other drugs are being used. Um, one of the good things about Tizanidine, besides it works in fibromyalgia, is that it's not in that, that beers list that we keep getting all these things. I don't know if you all have given anybody Flexeril that's on Medicare and maybe they're 50 years old and they're on disability and they got a bad back and they're on Flexeril and you get a letter saying, you know, that's dangerous in the elderly. And if you read that original paper that Beers wrote, he said, um, be careful in the elderly. And he meant the elderly, like I guess 80. And um, I think we all know it, but we're getting these letters constantly. I mean, had Blue Cross come out to talk to me because I write so much Flexeril. Well, I treat a lot of fibromyalgia. And Tizanidine now is a centrally acting uh, alpha-2 adrenergic receptor agonist. It's closest, it's, it has the name Xanaflex, it sounds like a muscle relaxer, but its closest relative in the drug field is clonidine. And you know, a lot of the drug uh, doctors, the pain management doctors, use clonidine to treat pain. It's short acting, it uses, it's, um, it, it's used for spasticity, but we found it was effective in uh, fibromyalgia. And there's no direct effect on the skeletal muscle. So it is not really a muscle relaxer. And it does have anti-nociceptive activity in animal study, studies. Uh, it's a glut, glutamate release inhibitor. Um, it's been shown in animals to decrease substance P and also in humans. And it has some patholytic effects also. And this is a study we, I did and then I published it did this whole study for 15,000, so that was a, was a bargain. Actually, when I first did this, the drug was brand name, and now it's generic. Uh, and by the time I published it, it was generic, so nobody ever heard about the study except in fibromyalgia world. But uh, it, the improvement of week seven was statistically significant in all these areas. This is the VAS global assessment of, you know, that's the patient telling you that I feel better. The FIQ is the fibromyalgia impact questionnaire. Uh, this is the fatigue, pain, sleep. At 14 weeks, we still had fatigue was better, tenor points were better. Some of these other things had fallen off. And that's, I think, common in a lot of our patients with fibromyalgia. Uh, what happened is I reanalyzed the data, looking at those that were employed or retired versus those that were disabled or retired on disability. And when we took out the people that were disabled, all these were statistically significant um, with pain and global assessment and all the other measures. 
after my study and I published it, all the other trials now for fibromyalgia, they don't let anybody in there that's disabled. And I guess one of the things is you're seeing these people back, you're treating them in this kind of study in your office, but you're, um, you're um, asking them, are you better? And you know, they're trying to get their disability, so they, you know, I'm just being cynical, but I think it may be true. And they'll say, well, no, I'm not that much better, doctor. I, I think I'm about the same. And so they don't show any improvement. And even though a lot of them, after we ended the study, they wanted to stay on the tizanidine. So you have to watch liver function tests. It's, it's um, idiosyncratic kind of effects, sort of like we see with diclofenac or Voltaren, or we see with uh, some other drugs that we use, like our uh, uh, um, Lipitor and those kind of drugs. Uh, you have to titrate it to avoid hypotension. Very unusual to see hypotension to get low doses. Hallucinosis has been something we've seen. Some of the people will have, like, uh, they'll see things in the room at night. We just stop it if that happens. Um, sedation is, is a problem with it, but that is actually good. So we give it at bedtime. It's one of the ways we can help them sleep, plus help the fibromyalgia. Now, a new thing we're using is this low-dose naltrexone. And uh, this is really fascinating stuff. The, uh, I had a patient come in, and they were telling me they had a, uh, a, there was a guy in Sylacauga in a wheelchair, and he had MS, and he was started on low-dose naltrexone, and he was back working as a landscaper. So I told her, I said, I can't give this to you. I don't even know what it is. Uh, I need to research it, but I'm going to look into it. So I found out there was a group at Stanford in California doing research in fibromyalgia, and I'm going to show you their research. They showed it helped. So we started writing it about four years ago, and I've written a, a lots of it. It has to be compounded because we're at low doses. It's a narcotic antagonist, so you really can't use it with narcotics. You can, I mean, there are even some drugs on the market with narcotic antagonists. You know, we know about Suboxone. There's a morphine-naloxone combination. Uh, but it's not habit-forming. It's not narcotic. So a lot of these patients don't want anything narcotic, don't want anything habit-forming. It's good for them. People, you don't want to ever give them a narcotic or you want to give them a reason not to give them one, it's a good thing to use. Uh, it's generic. It came out in 84. It's used at high doses at 50 milligrams to prevent, uh, you know, to, for people with narcotic and alcohol problems. It has to be compounded. We found a compounding shop now that it's down to $20 a month or $15 a month if you get three months at one time. So very inexpensive compared to a lot of our new drugs. Uh, this it was studied at Stanford, and uh, they got placebo for two weeks, and then they got low-dose naltrexone. And you can see when they got the next naltrexone, this is their symptom severity went way down. Um, the adverse events, they had very few. I mean, if you look at the 50 milligram tablet in the PDR, very little side effect. Um, we've uh, had some people had vivid dreams. I've had some people had tachycardia at night. Uh, generally not a big problem. You know, some of these people with fibromyalgia have this multiple chemical sensitivity, and it's like everything you give them, they have a problem with it, and uh, that can be a real issue. But this has been something that we've been able to give people without a lot of issues. Now, what about NMDA receptors? We said the NMDA receptors are, are activated. What about giving a receptor antagonists? Dextromethorphan is out there, and um, you know, it's in uh, Robitussin, uh, but you can get it separately. We've tried it. I didn't think it really worked too well. Amantadine uh, is being used um, uh, for a lot of prevention of um, neurological damage and thing in people with strokes, uh, probably because of the NMDA effect. Uh, we haven't really had much use for these things. Methadone does have a dual effect. It has an NMDA blocker as well as narcotic. So maybe it's uh, helpful, but it's, nobody wants to be giving patients a lot of methadone. I mean, I have a few people on methadone, but I try to stay away from it. Ketamine, which we can use topically, I think it has been helpful. We use this ketamine cream that they compound with other things. And uh, I think we've had a lot of people tell me that helps. Angel dust, you know, is, is a NMDA blocker. And when you start blocking NMDA like this uh, robo high, you know, the kids will overdose on dextromethorphan because you get, you get these uh, hallucinations and things. It's probably the same thing that happens with angel dust. So NMDA blockade is a little diff, uh, touchy, you know. It's not something that the only thing I found that's really been helpful is the ketamine cream topically. 
Magnesium does stabilize NMDA receptors. I think magnesium is a good supplement for these people to take. And then topical agents, we do use lidoderm patches. Uh, we use this uh, ketoprofen gel, some people, um, and um, the uh, ketamine cream that they compound with baclofen, xylocaine, cyclobenzaprine, diclofenac, gabapentin. Question, are you, the topical agents, are you putting those where it hurts? Or yeah, where it hurts. But I've had a lot of people, we tried a lot of these things, and we kind of stumbled into the ketamine thing because I heard people were using it, and, and it's amazing how many people we've had. We've probably had a 1,000 that have told me it helped. I mean, it's, uh, it's been really, really good. These, there is a lot of polypharmacy in these people, but I think there is this multimodal pain treatment, and... I think a lot of times you can give lower doses of individual drugs and block pain in different ways instead of giving, you know, instead of giving 3,600 milligrams of gabapentin and the person has trouble functioning, you can give a lower dose gabapentin, give them some tizanidine, give them low dose naltrexone, and they can actually do really well. So when you do this, you have opioid sparing and you also have decreased uh, potential for adverse events. And there are a lot of these synergistic things, and I guess you see people on, they go to the pain centers and you'll see they're on a lot of different things, but I think that's the idea, is that you're trying to get these uh, um, pain pathways in different, different ways. Now sleep, I think uh, the best thing I found with sleep is using tizanidine. The people that just have this intractable insomnia, they just can't sleep at all. We have been using Seroquel or Quetiapine in low doses. You know, it's gone generic, so the price has come way down. It's like I use like 25 milligrams at bedtime. And that, some of these people, I mean, I had a, when I first started using I had a couple people that actually wet the bed. They slept that soundly. So we don't want people like conked out, but uh, some of these people that tell you they just cannot sleep no matter what. You know, Zulpidem is, is probably the number one drug for sleep, but you know, I always ask people if they have any kind of uh, sleepwalking habits. You know, there's been a lot of studies, a lot of anecdotal reports of people getting up and doing things at night. I've had people cooking. I had one lady feeding ice cream to her dog, according to her husband. You know, they don't remember it in the morning. That's the amazing thing. The, the funniest one I heard was the, the guy at 3 in the morning wakes up, calls his ex-girlfriend, tells her he wants to come over and kiss her, and his wife's laying next to him in bed. And he doesn't remember anything the next day. And, you know, she's telling me the story in the office and his wife, you can see the steam, you know, she's still like burned over this thing. And then there was a guy that was in college. He took his aunt, his, his roommate says, you need to get some kitty litter. So the guy takes his aunt and goes to bed. Well, his roommate went out, bought a six pack of beer, puts it in the refrigerator, goes to bed. Well, the guy gets up, he drinks all the beer, he gets in his car and he runs into somebody's house. And when the police get there, he said he was going to get kitty litter. You know, I mean, that was on his brain. And luckily, the lady's house he hit, apparently her mother had done something weird on Ambien, and so she just didn't price, press charges, just got him to pay for the damage. But you see, you know, I always ask people that, because I mean, I don't want people out driving. I mean, I've heard so many crazy stories of people on, uh, I had one, two uh, uh, husband and wife, they're both taking it. I said, God, you all could have an orgy. Next morning, you wouldn't remember anything about it, you know? <laughs> Cyclobenzaprine, another good one, you know, as we said, it works, it is a tricyclic, and, um, as far as fatigue, now this is the hardest thing to treat. You can get people where they don't hurt, you can get them where they're sleeping, but they still feel terrible as far as the fatigue. They're just tired and it's, it's uh, very hard. So exercise we know raises serotonin, norepinephrine. Norepinephrine of course gives you more energy, so I think water therapy in a lot of these people is good. We do recommend water therapy and Lakeshore has a great program. A lot of, a lot of places around town here have it. They have it in other cities. In towns around the Al uh, Alabama. ProVigil and NuVigil have both been very helpful. You know, they did a study in um, ProVigil with MS showing it seemed to help fatigue. It wasn't a study that was done for the FDA, so it's not approved for that. It's approved for narcolepsy. I think the, the reasons we can get it approved are, are narcolepsy, sleep apnea, and um, what's the third one? Um, shift work. Shift work disorder. And shift work, apparently they're pretty liberal about, you know, if your patient has to get up at 6 to go to work and then maybe or get home late or whatever, they work for a doctor, they get home work. 
The problem we've really had with these two drugs is just the cost. I mean, ProVigil went generic, and it's already, it's still $600 a month or some crazy thing. New Vigil's about $400 a month. New Vigil was bought by Teva, and Teva's the big generic maker. I mean, they're the one that go, everything was price. You know, they want everything low price. And uh, now they have this drug that's like $400 a month. So we do try to get it approved for people. It does seem to work. I had a, uh, talked to a guy the other night, a, a physician. He's a, it was a flight surgeon over in Germany, and he said they used to give the pilots new vigil. They'd give them Ambien to sleep, and then they'd give them new vigil to get them going in the, in the morning. Um, Ritalin we can use. Uh, you know, a lot of these things, they get a, like a tachyphylaxis, so they kind of work for a little while, and then they quit working. We have used Adderall dextrine. I, I just tried, I don't know, we've had some problems. We've had a couple, I uh, had two people that were both related. They were like cousins, I think. Both of them got really paranoid on Adderall. Um, I mean, one lady almost really decompensated. So I just try to be really careful. Um, I know Adderall's direct, generic. A lot of the patients will say, well, you can't give me all this other, how about Adderall? You know, and uh, it's of course another one that could be ab abused also. Then some of the antidepressants actually will help. Uh, Cymbalta, Civella, Raisin, Norepinephrine, that will help with uh, fatigue. Some of these people have low-grade autoimmunity. You give them Plaquenil, 200 milligrams a day. You know, Plaquenil can cause eye problems. It's extremely rare. I've probably given it to three or 4,000 people. I've had uh, one, the worst case I've had presented to a state conference, a lady still playing tennis. She's glad she took it. She took it 13 years. So. It's very rare to have problems with Plaquenil. You do have to get them to get, get their eyes examined. Most of the eye doctors tell telling people once a year is plenty. You want to stay below six milligrams per kilogram, so you always want to keep the dose six milligrams per kilogram or less. And I think the people that have gotten in trouble, sometimes they're very small women, weigh only like 90 pounds, they're giving them 400 milligrams a day, or even 200 might be over their six milligram per kilogram limit. So. That's probably been the main thing. But a lot of these people, we have them on tizanidine, we have them on low-dose naltrexone, we have them on Plaquenil, and they are really feeling good. And it's, all of them are generic. It's not expensive treatment. And um, it's really satisfying Friday afternoon where a patient comes in and they say, I have fibromyalgia, and they say, all I need is my refills. And you're like, wow, this is, I've never seen this before. You know? And that's, I think, where we're headed with some of this.